Hey, good morning, everyone. My name is Alex, and I'm going to talk today about uh, what is good software design and why it matters. And this is a, a topic that has been interest, very interesting to me for the past 15 years. And so I have three core questions that I'd like to answer. Uh, the first one is, what is software design? When you think about it, uh, we read a lot of books, and I've read a lot of books, but there isn't one definite answer. So I try to figure it by myself. Uh, the second one is, what makes software design good? Mm -hmm. And as we know, we all kind of agree in this industry that we need good software design, but when it comes to saying what is good software design, we start fighting. So it's very important to figure out what really is. And how do you get to the point where we obtain good software design? What, is there any kind of recipe that you can use? Uh, and so I will share some of my thoughts on this. Uh, but before we start, I have to warn you that I work in a strange team. Uh, and sometimes I don't understand the problems that other people have. Uh, for example, we are four girls and two guys. So this is pretty strange for me when we hear you know, problems with um, gender balance and things like that. We like to communicate, which I know it sounds, uh, it doesn't sound much, but it's actually very important. Uh, really communicating without fighting or without, uh, I don't know, challenging each other in a bad way. And learning is mandatory. So whenever people tell me that, you know, we don't have time to learn, that's like, how can this happen? Um, and so if you hear me saying some things that don't make sense to you, it's probably because I come from this very strange context. And uh, we can discuss details at uh, the open space. A few things about the talk. Uh, first of all, it's a high level talk. So I won't go into code level details, exactly how to write code and so on. I will just point you towards resources, things that you can use. Uh, to, to go deeper into the topic. Uh, my purpose here is to get you started on a path. It's not really to uh, move you uh, a lot further away. It's not exhaustive. So if I don't, this is a huge topic. I could speak 10 times more on this topic. But of course, we don't have the time today. And I will focus on some new advice, on new things that I figured out. So you won't hear me talking a lot about practices that we know are good, uh, like maybe domain-driven design or things like that. And it doesn't mean that I don't approve them or that I don't agree with them. It just means that uh, I focus on some things that I couldn't find in other in places. But before we start, and because we have a bunch of uh, um, people that are not Romanian, I'd like to teach you three Romanian words that you can use during this talk, okay, to, uh, to give me feedback. So the first one is very easy. It's like in Russian, okay? It's da. Can you repeat? Da. Uh -huh. Okay, that means yes. So when you agree with something, that's, that's the word. The second one, very easy. No. No. Okay. That means no. Very easy. And then it's a third one. Yoi. <laughs> Please repeat. Okay. This is the a word that we use uh, often in our team because we are from one part of Romania where it's used. And it's an exclamation of surprise. So when something is interesting, that's, that's what we say. Um, okay, so what is software design? Uh, to go into this question, uh, I like first to look at history. I think we often forget where software comes from, and we often forget what we went through to get to this point. And I love history. I love uh, searching things in, in the history of computers and learning about the Babbage's difference machine, the, 
the first computer that actually uh, bankrupted uh, or almost bankrupted the people who tried to build it. Um, it was a mechanical computer. About the first computer programmer had a Lovelace who programmed before there were computers, which is an amazing feat. And we don't hear about them a lot. And I also like to share you one specific point in time when people were trying to build uh, a software for uh, the Apollo lunar module and what problems they faced with it. So I have a small video. And maybe I can play it. The solution today seems extraordinary. It was called rope memory. You actually had to send the program to a factory and women in the factory would literally weave the software into this core rope memory. Computer code consists of ones and zeros. In this case, it was a physical distinction. Margaret Hamilton was one of the very few female engineers on the project. The rope is made up of rings and wires. And if the wire goes through the core, it represents a one, and around the core, it represents a zero. It was extremely slow. One program could take several months to weave, and if there was an error, it was a nightmare to correct. The software program was falling dangerously behind schedule. One thing I like about this uh, video is it shows how on some things we went further away. We developed a lot of technologies. We don't have to weave software now, but on the other hand, we recognize many of the problems that they had back then. So it's interesting to think about these things. And why is this relevant? It's relevant because it shows us uh, where we started. We started by needing more complexity in our programs. And you can imagine that it was very hard to reason about programs when they were a bunch of ones and zeros. So this moved us into larger code bases. We needed to grow the code. And unfortunately, the human brain is not very uh, good at keeping information. You can keep about seven pieces of information at one time. And so you need some kind of structure. You need a structure that allows you to reason about the program. So when you read the code to understand what's the dynamic behavior of it. And the way we did that was by dividing and conquering, uh, by splitting the program into abstractions. And there are various types of abstractions that we use. Uh, some of them are built-in abstractions. We created functions. We created lambdas. These were kind of the first things that came out of um, these thoughts on design. And we created classes later on. So, and then we have domain abstractions, like things like speaker, stream, controller, stuff like that, things that, or collection, things that tells, uh, tell us something about how that entity works. And instead of thinking into the smaller details, we think at the higher level of abstraction. Incidentally, if you read about object-oriented programming, and I read a lot of books and when I was in university, it was very hard to figure out what it is. Uh, the only thing I could find is kind of how, what facilities do the programming languages offer to you when they are object-oriented. And they offer things like encapsulation, objects and classes, inheritance, polymorphism. But, I, but why are these ideas useful? Uh, and you can think about uh, things like polymorphism. There's a clear um, good thing about it. Uh, you don't have to write the same code for reading 
let's say, uh, data from memory, and uh, you don't have to write separate code for reading data from memory or reading data from a file or reading data from separate uh, file systems because you have the notion of a stream. So then it allows us to minimize the code that we write. But how about others? Like inheritance is very, use, uh, very useful for using code, but we learned in time that it's not a very good idea to reuse code in this way. Um, so it's very interesting to me to look at why uh, object-oriented programming appeared. And it turns out that the initial idea from Alan Kay was more related to how cells work and how they communicate to each other with uh, chemical signals. So the idea was actually the best way I can express it is to move complexity from behavior into communication between small objects. Uh, and if you have a 500 lines class or larger, then this is completely missing the point of object-oriented programming. So, if we go back to the question, what is software design, maybe we can say this, um, that we try to manage complexity so that we can make sense of uh, the code. But that's probably not it. That's, there's more than that, because there are other constraints that we care about, like performance, security, and maybe a lot of other things. Uh, so, the first definition I came up with is that software design is about structuring the code so that we have certain desirable characteristics. But then which are these characteristics? And that's the next point. Because the next question is what is good software design? So, if we go and look, uh, when I talk about software design uh, at this level, uh, some programmers tell me, yeah, but you're talking about art. We need to get things out. Our managers are pushing us, and the customer is unhappy, and so on. But I don't think that software design is art. I'm talking about a completely different thing. So are you ready to see some code art? Yeah. 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 Okay. <laughs> this is an entry to the obfuscated C contest. And what it is, it's a program that you can actually compile, but it's a bunch of letters between Charlie and Charlotte. Uh, and you can read them as the letters between two lovers who have a quarrel. So it's really, really funny to look at these things. And this is what art is. Art is something that creates an emotional response. You either have fun or you are sad or uh, you start wondering about the meaning of life when you see things like that. But it's not what we are trying to achieve with software design. It's something different. So what are the desirable characteristics? And, and this is a very important thing. We tend to think about software design as being good or bad in, uh, in absolute terms. We tend to think that it's good software design typically because I wrote it. And it's bad software design, typically because you wrote it. Okay? So, and it's not a very good way of uh, thinking about it, because obviously we cannot have a lot of constructive conversations in this case. So what I like to do is to think about the desirable characteristics that I want, and I gave you here a few examples. This is not an exhaustive list by far. And to think what are the most important in our context. Because different projects have different needs. Uh, if you are working for a, uh, an application used by accountants in Switzerland, you probably don't need a lot of changeability. Okay. Maybe you need more performance or stability or things like that. Uh, but if you are working on a web startup, then you need a lot of changeability. You need to be able to add things very fast and keep the cost of change low. And this leads us to the business context, because that's very important. Actually, each one of these characteristics has a business benefit. And this is the important thing. I think good software design, like other design disciplines, is the thing that supports the business in the best way. <clears throat> so
So you can look at things like security and wonder, OK, why are we doing security? Why well, in our case for Eventrix, what we care about is reputation. If something happens, then our reputation will go down, and then we have to invest into rebuilding it. And that's not something that we want to do. So, but if you think about other contexts, security can uh, mean different things for different projects. So it's very important to, for me to figure out which are the business benefits and then understand which are the characteristics that we want about design and kind of make a top of that. Now, I never actually sit down and write grades like this. I more think of a top 10. Like these are the three that we care about. These are the three that are OK. We have need to have them less. And these are three that we don't really care about at this point. Uh, for example, one of them is performance in our case, because we know we can always improve it later when we have more users. So, and so good software design is actually contextual. That's the very important thing. And I think it's important to align the whole thing on what this means. So my final definition is that good software design is structuring the code so that certain desirable business characteristics are met. And thinking about this, I came up with other ideas because it turns out all designs have users, right? Every domain, everything that we design has users. Uh, the chairs that you are using, are sitting on right now have you as user, and somebody designed them. Um, and we don't think of a lot about what is the user for software design. We tend to think that it's the end user. But it's not, because as an end user, I don't care what, how the application is structured. And this started me on a path of uh, thinking about who are the users and how can we use things from user experience into software design. And that's uh, when I figured out that the users of software design are the programmers, testers, everybody who actually has to work with the code, with the design. And this leads to a very interesting thing, which I will just brush around. Uh, we have, I have a separate talk that you can find online about this, uh, about using usability uh, design qualities and apply them to software design in order to improve, uh, to get some economical benefits, like we are making less mistakes, we do more, uh, we are faster, because the most common tasks are, uh, we are able to do them faster, and so on. And lots of them you can do by structuring the code in a different way. For example, uh, an interesting design quality is navigability, something that we discovered when discussing about uh, usable software design. Uh, how easy it is for you to get from one file where you are now into the file where you need to change things. Because if, you, if it takes you a long time, and I've seen a, at least one thing where it took a very long time to do that, multiply this by hundreds of times, and you lose a lot of mental energy, a lot of focus, and a lot of productivity. And it's not only that it's not productive, but it's also it's annoying as a developer to have to do that. Another thing is, for example, what happens when a new developer comes in? How easy it is to install everything that he needs? Is it just running the script and then in five minutes or 20 minutes you have everything? Or does it take three weeks to do that? Uh, these are important things. And they, are, they relate to the design. But again, I'm not going into the more details. Uh, I wrote about this topic. And uh, you can find a lot of uh, things about it if you search for usable software design. So the next question is how do we obtain good software design? If we know what it is, how do we get there? And I think that it's uh, a matter of two things. 
combining two very important things, good design practices and good designers. Uh, it's obvious when you think about it this way, but we rarely actually, I haven't actually heard this put in this way. So I like to read a lot about uh, general design, about how other design disciplines work. And fortunately, design is actually a very long uh, discipline, a very long-lived discipline. The pyramids were designed, okay, the pyramids in Egypt. So it's like, it's a 7,000 years history, and yet we treat software design like it's something completely new uh, that doesn't follow the principles of everything else. Now, of course, there are differences because, again, it's one thing to design a chair, it's a completely different thing to design a car and for a spaceship. And it's a completely different thing to design software. But at the same time, there are things that repeat over the design, various design disciplines. And I like very much this book. Uh, it's called Design Creation of Artifacts in Society. It's a free book written by Carl Ulrich. And he worked into many uh, different design uh, contexts. He worked in industrial design, he worked with software developers, in software design, and so on. Um, and he came up with a few models that summarize what he saw. And as you can see, there are two parts. Typically, there are two parts, uh, design and production. It doesn't mean that these are separate. In, in fact, in software development, the two are very closely connected. Uh, this is the difference. The main difference with code is that uh, it's much more malleable. You can get the result much more quickly than, for example, if you have to chisel or uh, work with metal. But it's kind of the same idea. And again, he speaks about these uh, four information processing steps that define the design which is first sensing the gap, knowing that there is a problem that you need to fix, knowing that there is a user experience gap, how he calls it. Um, and then defining a problem, exploring alternatives, selecting a plan. And what's very interesting to me is that I rarely see uh, the step of exploring alternatives built into the way we do software design. We typically tend to jump on the first solution that works and then stick with it. But uh, we rarely sit down and think about, let's say, three different ways and then try to implement those and see what are advantages and disadvantages and so on. And it, maybe you cannot do this for every design problem at work, but there are a lot of other places where we can do this, and one of them is code retreats, which I will talk about in a minute. Um, so, if we have this process, if you look, the first thing is to define the problem. And I like to tell people that, you know, if your requirements are not clear enough, then the garbage in, garbage out law applies. Okay? If you don't have requirements clear enough, guess what, the code will not be good enough. Um, and so we need to work on ways to understanding the problem that we try to solve. And I think that the best way that I found um, was uh, behavior driven development. And actually there are two techniques. The first technique is the five whys technique. Uh, before starting, I think Francisca mentioned it uh, yesterday, before starting to actually implement something, start wondering, okay, but why are we doing that? And why is this needed? And so on. Until you get to the, what the actual problem is. Too often, as uh, software developers, we get a task that says, implement a stored procedure somewhere. But why? What's, what's its purpose? Maybe we can find a simpler way. And the other thing is, uh, behavior-driven development to figure out, especially the conversation, in order to figure out what are we trying to solve first. 
And this is a very important step for me because if I don't know what I'm trying to solve, then probably the solution will not be good enough. <coughs> Another thing that I've seen, I've rarely seen discussed, is to understand the constraints that you have for your design. Whenever you are designing something, you have certain constraints. Um, like the chairs in this room, they have to look in a certain way. Um, is the same with software. And we know some of the typical constraints, like time and money. This is very obvious. Uh, we know that we have certain deadlines, so, and we know that we have um, certain money limitations. But there is another constraint that we often have, which is knowledge. How much do we know? What is the extent of our knowledge as a team on software design? our capabilities, how far can we go with this design? Are there things that we should avoid because we don't master them? Or things that we should uh, just, uh, we know that we are very good at them and keep doing those. Um, and this is very important. I have a story that at some point um, I learned how to abuse uh, delegates in C Sharp. I think it was C Sharp version two. Uh, to use them as lambda expressions. And it's a very nice thing because you can actually remove a lot of duplication from the code. But the code became uh, harder to read. And this was a knowledge problem because the other people, my colleagues, could not read this uh, code construct. So what do you do? The worst thing that you can do is to use it and don't care about the others. So I had two good options. One of them was to teach them, and the other one was to um, stop using it. And because of the various other constraints at the time, I chose not to use it. But this is something that you do uh, based on the knowledge that is in, in the thing. <coughs> Another thing that we find a lot in, uh, in many design disciplines is the prototype. And Prototyping is much easier to do in software development than it is in other disciplines. Apple is well known for building first, uh, coming with 10 different ideas for a product, seven or 10, I don't remember exactly, and then picking three of them and developing them up to a working prototype level, and then picking one that they continue doing. And they incur a lot of cost by doing this, but they also get to create products that are very well appreciated. So um, we do less of this in software de development, although it's easier to do in a way. It's much easier to try various options for half an hour, 45 minutes, and then figure out which ones work and which don't. Um, and Again, code retreats are great for this because of code retreats what we do is we use the same problem and then delete the code after 45 minutes and then try another approach. So you can see a lot of design alternatives uh, on the same problem and kind of build up your design skills by doing so. And the process is great. Uh, the best process that we have is by far test-driven development. But this is just a process. Uh, it comes with some built-in design qualities, like once you write the tests, you have them to validate your code. So you get some mistake proofing in there. Uh, and you have some feedback. But the reality is that you can use TDD and end up with very nice code. So it's important, uh, I wrote a lengthy article about what test-driven development is, and I'll just summarize it for you. Uh, and I think it's important to understand that the process is very good, and test-driven development gives us a kind of flow, and focusing on one thing at a time, figuring that out, solving that one problem, and then moving to the next one. But it's not enough to obtain good designs. You also need the skills as a designer. 
And maybe you notice that I talk a lot about software designers. Uh, and there is a very strange thing that has happened in this uh, industry where we try to separate, to take things from other industries and say, some people are programmers, and some people are designers, and some people are architects, and some people are, I don't know, other kinds of things. And the reality is, if you notice, my definition of software design is about the code. Because the code is the design. The code is the only blueprint that you use to create the, the end product, which is the application. The only build that you do in software design is when you build your code. So what you have is, given that the code is the design, whenever you make a change in the code, you are actually designing. Now, design also implies intent. Okay. That's a very important part of design. It implies intent. And if you just change the code mindlessly, then yeah, it's not design. But I guess most of the times we try to solve a problem. So, uh, this is why, congratulations, you've just been promoted to the role of software designer. Uh, and this is why I'd like to spend some more time discussing about what it takes to become a better designer. Because as you've seen, the decisions that you make in your code can influence the business in a way or another. And I think that a good professional in any domain is somebody that is able to elevate the business, or at least not <coughs> impede its development. Um, and I came up with, from very, my various experiences, I came up with a few things. Again, they are not exhaustive. But uh, the first one is educating taste. So I have to tell you I have a very poor taste for graphical design. I'm not very good at it. I, when I first tried my, to play with uh, graphical design, what I got looked really strange in the end. Um, but what I started doing is to educate my taste, to look at design magazine and figure out, OK, so what is good and what is not good? What do these people who know what they are doing say that it's good? and what is not so good. And how you can educate your taste as a software designer is by looking at other code bases and pair programming with people and discussing code but without any feelings because I am not my code. It's very important to repeat that to yourself. I am not my code. Um, if somebody gives me feedback on my code, it's because Maybe I was tired, maybe I haven't, I didn't have a lot of <coughs> brain power at that point. Uh, and I often get bad code. But it's important to figure out that it is bad. Um, and of course, there's clean code, um, a really great book that I advise you to read if you haven't. And, uh, there are all these events where you can gather them talk to other people and see uh, what is going. What does it mean to have good designs? Uh, one particular thing here is finding simplicity. Um, simplicity is a very difficult thing to find in, in software design. I also, I'm also very annoyed because most of the code samples that you see online for libraries or frameworks and so on, they are not very good code. The code looks, typically looks awful. Uh, so those places that should educate us on what good code means in the context of that framework or library and so on, they are not very, doing a very good job. So we have to find our inspiration somewhere else. And now about simplicity, <coughs> an important thing that I learned recently is we have to make a distinction between simplicity and familiarity. Just because you are familiar with something, it doesn't mean it's the simplest solution. Sometimes you need to expand to become familiar with other things uh, in order to uh, 
get to simplicity. And this relates to the idea of expressing yourself. And um, I like a lot, uh, for example, to use functional constructs. And if you try to replace your loops with functional constructs, you will get code that is much more readable, or that you can understand. Um, and this expressivity, or this ability to express yourself in your language is something that you develop in time. And I learned it by um, watching people like Corey Haynes and Ruby Rainsberger, who really deeply care about their code and learn how to express themselves better with it. Another interesting thing is to educate a sense of observation. Um, a very important part of being a designer, again, I hope with this somehow from other design disciplines, is to be able to notice things. To notice when something doesn't quite work. To notice when we keep having the same problem at around the same place in the code. To notice when we are, I don't know, annoyed by, we don't understand exactly the same parts of the code over and over again. Um, and this is one level of observation. There is another level of observation which is much harder that I will talk about in a minute. Um, another thing is research. Um, I found, again, I like looking for how other design disciplines are doing uh, their, what principles they follow, what practices they follow. And I found out that there are many similarities. I like to look at, uh, for example, how films are created, what it takes to do a, 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 to make a movie that looks how movies look today, really crisp and nice, and that said, tell us a bit of, uh, that are able to express themselves only by moving images. And this may seem again like artsy stuff, but it's actually not, because a lot of those things are techniques that we then um, uh, can use in software development. Like, for example, expressing yourself. Uh, if, if your medium is code, they can express yourself through text. If your medium is images, then you have to express yourself through moving images. Uh, and there's a lot of correlation between these two, very interesting. And the last thing, well, not the least, the, the last on my list is practice. Keep practicing your design skills. Try various things. Try other alternatives to what you are doing today. Uh, I liked a lot to try other programming languages, and one of the things that I kept doing was to uh, work on the same problem, but in various programming languages, and to see what are the differences between them. And after a while, I realized that I can take the best parts of Python and use them in C Sharp or in Ruby. Or, and it's really a cool thing. So if you think you're uh, yourself as a designer, then you have something more. It just opens up a world of possibilities, things that you can look at, things that you can learn. Um, I'll just briefly mention this book. Uh, again, it's a book on uh, design principles. It's actually the first time in a long time when I had to study a book, like actually read it and take notes and uh, it's a very deep uh, book about a few, I think there are a few hundreds principles of design that can be applied in various disciplines and then uh, with a lot of examples of how they apply in graphical design and industrial design and so on. There isn't a lot about how to apply them to software design, uh, but there's a lot of information there that can just sit kind of in the back of your mind when then you can use it when it comes handy. OK, so I mentioned one difficult uh, observation skill. There is an observation skill that's developed with good designers. So you know déjà vu, right? Déjà vu means that you see 
the same, you, you think that you saw the same thing that you've seen before. Now, this is the opposite in a way. It's after you've seen something for hundreds of times, there comes a moment where you see it with different eyes. And that's called deja vu. It's a completely different term. Um, and I mentioned code retreats. At code retreats, we use Conway's Game of Life. And I facilitated about probably 35, 40 of those. I don't remember exactly how many. And if you multiply them by uh, about 10 different pairs and about six sessions, you can see that I've seen hundreds of times the same problem being solved in various programming languages and in various contexts. Um, and I've seen this construct, part of the Conway's game of life, the idea is to look for neighbors. It's a two-dimensional grid, and for one cell, you need to look for neighbors and do some computations. And I've seen this in various forms. I just wrote the simplest one, but I've seen this in various forms for hundreds of times. And there was a moment when I was doing this kata on uh, Conway's Game of Life, and I looked at it, and uh, I knew something was off because we keep adding and removing once. But what, what is it? What's the code trying to tell me with this? And I couldn't say exactly what it is, what's trying to tell me. And suddenly it hit me that this is an axis. And it's an axis that has like a negative part and a, a positive part. And if you think about it, it's, of course, it's an orthogonal universe. It has two axes. And if you think about axes, and if you know a bit about Conway's DM of life, try to design your software using, design your solution using this concept, and you'll see that it gets much easier. And it's much more extensible, because there are variations to Conway's DM of life, which we use sometimes to show people that they don't know how to design uh, their code. And it's, uh, and then this concept of axis allows you to expand the structure of the universe in a very nice way. So <clears throat> these were, this was a very interesting episode for me. And yeah, it seems that it has a name in the design community and it's called the Jardim. Now about expressing yourself, again, I, may, I talked a bit about it. Um, one of the hardest things to do is to find good names for things. That is probably the hardest thing. And I, find, I often find myself looking online for English language dictionaries that explain differences between words just to figure out what is the good word for what I'm trying to express. And as you know, uh, what we are doing, the code needs to be very precise. And when you read it, it needs to tell you what, what it's about. So naming is a very hard thing. And to me, it's very interesting because on the other hand, I like to write a lot. And when you write, again, what part of this is to find the right words to say, to express something. So these two are very similar. And I think that on a certain level, if you train yourself to write uh, based on certain rules, um, then you can also become a better developer because this leads back into how you name things and how you write your code and so on. Um, I mentioned functional constructs. I think especially when you work with collections, there's only one thing that you take from this. When you work with collections, try to replace loops with functional constructs and see that it's much more expressive. It's much easier to understand what happens there. And I mentioned here that you need to know your programming language. Uh, the, that obfuscated C contest entry actually shows a very good level of knowledge about the programming language itself. 
so I wouldn't do this in production, but if you try to abuse your language a bit and see what you can do with it, um, this allows you to learn much more about it. And then hopefully this will feed back into your daily job and try to express something and realize, oh, but I've tried this just for fun. Now it's something that works. So there's one thing that I'd like you to take from this talk is to start thinking of yourself as software designers and to start paying more attention about on, not only on processes, not only on the technical parts of this, but also on what it takes for you to become a better designer. And there is also the case that in software development we don't have a lot of role models. We, I don't think many of you can name one person that influenced you a lot <coughs> as a software developer. But it turns out that if you look at the design disciplines as a whole, you can find people that uh, are very influential and very good role models. And one of them for me was Antoni Gaudi, the architect who built uh, a lot of buildings in Barcelona. And I wrote uh, an article about that too. But the idea was that this was this guy who knew, who had a lot of mastery of his craft, but he was also very humble. And it was something that hit uh, with me on a personal level, and it stays with me. So, you are a software designer, and what I'm asking from you is to think about ways today and after you leave this conference to push your limits as what you can do as a software designer. Thank you. Thank you.